I'm Heidi Agler. I'm from a research firm called BBC in Denver, and we have been hired by the city of Fort Collins to do the study we're going to talk about today. It's called an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. I'm here with uh, Jen Garner, who works with me very closely on these studies. And we were joined by James Whiteside, who's enforcement branch chief. I got all the words, but out of order, um, for the the FHEO, which is the Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Office of HUD. He's also from Denver. And we're going to talk tonight not only about the study that Jen and I have been working on, but James has joined us to talk more specifically about fair housing law. And we're going to have him talk first, and then Jen and I will present information on the study in particular. The other thing that I want to make sure that everyone understands, Jen and I and James are not currently practicing lawyers. So we can't take complaints. We can't offer legal advice about something that you've experienced. James can talk to you about specifically about how to file a complaint. And he can answer a lot of questions around fair housing. But we're not here to offer legal advice tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to James to talk a bit. And then Jen and I will be back in a few minutes. My name is James Whiteside. I'm the Enforcement Branch Chief with Denver's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity with HUD. I'm also the Intake Branch Chief. Conceptually, what does that mean? That basically means that anybody who files a complaint with an administrative agency in Colorado, Utah, North and South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana, if it's with us or one of our sister agencies, chances are I'm going to read about that complaint and that investigation. So I feel it gives me a pretty good tenor of what the issues are out there. The first thing I'm going to do is kind of talk about just fair housing generally. How did we get to this point? What is the genesis of fair housing law? What are the origins of it? A lot of it is the picture of the history of our country. Uh, it's always good to remind ourselves this is April. This is Fair Housing Month. Uh, we celebrate Fair Housing Month every April, uh, ever since 1968 when the law was passed. And so I think it's good to know the history of our country and how we continue to take steps towards equality to be able to ensure the promise of the Fair Housing Act, open housing, and equal opportunity for all. At HUD, we did create a Fair Housing Month theme. This year it's Live Free, which is very similar to our 2011 slogan, which was Live Free. Uh, and that means housing discrimination <laughs> has no place in America that no one should be unlawfully denied housing of their choice. This year we create a subcategory to that, and that is creating equal housing opportunity in every community. And that reflects our commitment to work with our communities, to work with our partners, to work with housing advocates, to ensure that everyone who calls America home gets to live where they choose, irrespective of their race, color, national origin, gender, religion, and familial status. So why fair housing? What does fair housing conceptually mean? Why is it important? When we battle housing discrimination, that is one of the biggest things we could do in our communities to effectuate change and seek balanced living patterns. Promoting equality, open housing choice, that eliminates barriers to equal opportunities. It creates access to equal opportunity. And we have powerful tools to address discrimination. And those comes in fair housing laws. And I consider the Fair Housing Act, the bellwether, the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968, and to me that's a capital F, capital H fair housing. But there's a lot of lowercase f, lowercase h fair housing laws that exist. And there's a lot of state and local laws. The first actual fair housing ordinance was passed by the city of New York in 1957. The first state that passed a fair housing law was the state of Colorado. So the history of discrimination exists, or the history of battling discrimination through the laws exists before 1968. And in fact, we actually go back even farther than that. But the importance of the genesis of between the 50s and 60s when the civil rights movement saw the pursuit of open housing, of fair housing uh, legislation, was so that we could pursue integrated and balanced living patterns. That's actually the purpose that was cited on the Senate floor when they were debating the Fair Housing Act, to replace the ghettos with truly integrated and balanced living patterns. And I always find it such a powerful statement when we think about battling housing discrimination, when we think about equality, living patterns. It doesn't say Joe deserves an apartment on Smith Street. It's living patterns. It's how we live with each other in our communities, how we eliminate those disproportionate needs in pursuit of balancing out lives for all of us. And you might hear me throughout this, and maybe even later when we take questions and answer, I'll always say that, truly integrated and balanced living patterns. It's one of those things, say it three times, really, so you can always constantly think. When you think about fair housing, when you think about a fair housing issue, you're thinking about integrated and balanced living patterns. 
So like I said, the story of fair housing extends way before 1968. We're familiar with our nation's history. We're familiar with the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. Well, that declaration didn't necessarily include everyone. It certainly didn't include Indians who were considered savages at the time. When we create our Constitution, we are going to work together as the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. And I say that in full quotes because that's what we're continuously moving towards. We're continuously taking steps towards that. Inequality obviously existed at the foundation of our country, but those principles were continuously working to form that more perfect union. And there have always been those among have, who have taken those strides, who's pushed us, and understood that the inequality that results from discrimination, discrimination because of who you are, who we are, creates limitations, it creates preferences, it creates inequity, it creates imbalance. A phrase that has been used often, and I think about the history of fair housing as we pursue those original foundational elements, those principles as we start as a country, it's often cited recently, uh, our president used it a few years ago in Denver, about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And he said that with great emotion, and a lot of that got attributed to Dr. King. Dr. King, the Fair Housing Act is a fitting tribute. He worked so hard for open housing legislation. But Dr. King actually took that phrase from an abolitionist minister in the 1850s. Theodore Parker. And he looked to that, the, the, the writings of Theodore Parker, an 1850s abolitionist minister in the Midwest, to derive how he wanted to articulate that there is a pursuit, that we're going to actually get there to ensure that liberty and equality for all can exist in this country. And a lot of that had to do with arguing for open housing legislation, whether it was in the Deep South or in the Midwest. And when we talk about the history of Fair housing, we talk about segregation. I understand that a lot of times we're talking about uh, living patterns or communities or urban environments that are very polarized. We see that if you look at the most segregated cities in the United States, the Midwest is right there. You're not going to see many uh, cities from the Rocky Mountain region. But those lessons that we need to learn from the coast, from the south, and from the Midwest is the reason why we can make so much progress out here in the Rocky Mountain region. Harriet Beecher Stowe was also somebody who worked in the mid-19th century to pursue what I would say is fair housing law. It was really civil rights, it was abolitionism, but she was asking for more voices to speak up. When she published Uncle Top's Cabin, which obviously was a very high critique of slavery, she actually said, I feel now that the time has come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. More voices needed to speak up to talk about the problems that inequity addressed and how we could develop solutions to those problems. The Civil War is obviously a pivotal part about our country's history. It really shone the light on inequity, on slavery. But I always look at that area, I look at the president at that time, who, a president who so represents our history of a country because how he had to mature and develop over time in President Lincoln. And I think back to that Constitution to form a more perfect union. How are we going to take the necessary steps to ensure equality? At the time, during the Civil War, Lincoln actually had to confront his previous thoughts about what was called colonization of African Americans. The previous part of his life, he was for colonization. In other words, exporting all slaves, or deporting, exporting, slaves, deporting all slaves, rather than making them free in the United States. But during the Civil War, he actually found that blacks asserted themselves for their Americanness, that they articulated a vision of American society where land of your birth is your citizen right, and equality before law did not depend on your color, your ancestry, or your racial designation. And Lincoln, just like our country has evolved, he evolved and matured as a statesman and be able to better understand the grasp of why humankind demands equality, and why later when the passage of the Fair Housing Act why some of us consider fair housing as a human right. And so we continuously took steps. We passed the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. We, we passed the 14th Amendment. The Equal Protection Clause is in the 14th Amendment. And those are actually little f, little h fair housing laws to me. Those laws are the foundational basis for why we can pass the Fair Housing Act. The 14th Amendment, actually Congress 
as is articulated almost 100 years after the passage of the 14th Amendment, was to give Congress the authority to eradicate all badges and incidents of slavery. And the first real federal fair housing law was in 1866. In 1866, Congress passed a law that addressed private and public discrimination. An intentional discrimination statute addressing public and private discrimination back in 1866. Now there is a caveat to that, and that it would took 102 years for Congress to have the authority, or for the courts to have the authority, to actually enforce that law or apply that law to private discrimination. So even though we had such a bold turn at the time of the Civil War, and we saw this movement towards passing civil rights laws, we still had this little left, little H fair housing law that could only address public discrimination. And so even though it's our first federal fair housing law, it still took 102 years to get its full force. But it prohibited discrimination based on race and color and the ownership of real and personal property. And even though it only addressed public discrimination, as we move through the 20th century, we found more ways that civil rights law, or really fair housing law, was able to effectuate change in our communities. We developed this modern understanding of the Constitution to ensure equality of all humankind, the more perfect union. Equality under law really started at that 14th. And when we could address public discrimination in housing, we were able to attack private covenants, restrictive zoning and land covenants, uh, land use restrictions. We are able to address a variety of ways in which cities and municipalities and local units of governments and even states Jim Crow laws were eventually being able to detect. They actually served a basis for promoting women's suffrage. So we're able to take steps towards the 60s in pursuit of fair housing and pursuit of open housing legislation that would be put on the books in 1968. And as we got further along, we were able to take further and further steps towards equality. And what happened when I mentioned the badges and incidents of slavery, Congress has a power to, to, to address badges and incidents of slavery through legislation. This 1866 civil rights law was finally given this full force in 1968, the same year of the passage of the Fair Housing Act. And that is when the Supreme Court articulated that Congress had that authority. This is an intentional discrimination law based on race, color, and national origin, and it's very powerful. In my office, we don't have jurisdiction to handle such claims. But before I came to HUD, oftentimes I would still use that 1866 law in my private practice as a fair housing attorney. It's a powerful law. There's no exemptions from it. If you're liable for intentional discrimination, you're liable under the statute. And in 1968, we see a huge step with now having two laws to address private discrimination in housing. And so how did we get there with the passage of the Fair Housing Act? In 1963, President Kennedy considered segregation a moral issue, racial discrimination a moral issue whether we had to ask ourselves whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we're going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. But it took a few more years for things to progress. The movement was afoot, but even by 1968, even a month before the passage of the Fair Housing Act, there wasn't really open housing legislation available to be passed in its current form. And what happened was a bill was reported out of the House of Representatives for voter rights protection, the civil rights law protecting voter rights. And Senator Walter Mondale, Democrat, Minnesota, and Edward Brooke, Senator Republican, Massachusetts, amended that act to include fair housing protections. Bipartisan support for fair and open housing legislation. Edward Brooke was an African-American former army officer in World War II. And his point with the need for this passage of this act, he can remember returning from World War II and not being able to find any housing in his native state of Massachusetts. Another thing, as, as this whole tide was turning, there was a Kerner Commission report. Lyndon Johnson put together a commission on civil disorders because there was rioting in the urban cities. And that report started in stark terms that we were headed towards a society of white and black, a system of apartheid in America separate but unequal. Part of the cutting into that previous 1866 law, that had to do with Plessy v. Ferguson. That's the railroad card case from Louisiana. The first tester, if you're familiar with fair housing, you know I think about testers. The first real tester, Homer Plessy, he tested the inequity uh, through a state of Louisiana 
streetcar law that segregated the, the, the streetcars. So we get to 1968, and we're stalled. You have this report that says in stark terms, we have two separate societies. We have rioting in the cities. We have the administration trying to push the support. We have a bipartisan bill that could be approved and signed into law by the president, but everything is stalled. Every, nothing is going anywhere. So what happened to turn the tide? On April 4th, 1968, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee. Rioting ensued. There was rioting in Washington, D.C. while Congress is in session. And this really made open housing legislation turn the corner and led to the passage of the Fair Housing Act. Lyndon Johnson, when he signed in the law, saw it as a fitting tribute to the Dr. King because Dr. King pushed for open housing legislation not just in the South, but in the Midwest. And the significance of this law was it created an open housing law prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, and religion. It provided for fair housing and he provided the authority to the full constitutional limits. In other words, it's a broad and inclusive act. It's not just addressing sophisticated form or unsophisticated forms of overt discrimination. It's addressing sophisticated, sophisticated forms. It's a tough sophistication to say. That. <laughs> Integrated balanced living patterns. You just have to, that's the, that's the. But it addresses sophisticated forms of discrimination and unsophisticated forms of discrimination. It protects not only against those whom to discrimination is directed, but also those whose very quality of their daily lives have been affected by discrimination. Our whole community, the whole community is affected by housing discrimination. And as time moved down, as we moved to 1974 and 1988 and later, we continually saw ways to strengthen this law. In 1974, gender or sex was covered as a protected class. In 1988, and before I get to the 1988, you might be looking at me and you're saying, well, this guy doesn't look like he was around in 1968. What does he know about fair housing? What does he know about segregation? And the truth of the matter is in 1968, HUD did not get a lot of authority or a lot of ability to enforce housing discrimination. There had to be a litigation response. The courts were the only means for you to get traction on these fair housing cases. And if you didn't have the resources or were wherewithal there was a whole, not a whole lot you could do. That also affects HUD's ability inside the agency with public housing and subsidized housing to address housing discrimination. And I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up five miles west of downtown Cleveland. And I grew up in about as white of a suburb as you'll ever see. Cleveland is currently the fifth most segregated city in the United States. But back then it was even worse. And it doesn't take much to travel that five miles from my house <coughs> to downtown Cleveland to see the effects of segregation, to see the effects of inequality. I was lucky enough growing up that I got to take a lot of those trips. And I also was lucky enough to learn about other problems. One of the women who was the driving force behind Sammy getting me into law school, she actually had the first house that essentially meets the visitability principles for access for individuals with physical impairments, accessibility. And what does that mean around 1988? Well, in 1988, Congress saw an additional way that we're segregating our communities. We're walking ourselves back to 1988, and we see that many of the same conditions that we saw confronted on race, color, and national origin were actually affecting individuals with disabilities, very clearly affecting individuals with disabilities. Segregation of, against individuals with disabilities was the norm. Institutionally, okay institutionalization of individuals with disability was the norm. So in 1988, we decided to confront this other great inequality, our treatment of individuals with disabilities. Think about the history of how fair housing and open housing and civil rights legislation came about for race, color, and national origin. And you still see the same thing, segregated living patterns, stereotypes, nimbyism, the inability to access opportunity. And so we amended the Fair Housing Act to include individuals with disabilities as a protected class. We also amended it to, to include familial status discrimination as prohibited under the Act. That's important because of access to opportunities for families with children, especially at moderate and low incomes. There was a huge barrier there for individuals to find safe, accessible housing. And when we think about these integrated and balanced living patterns, and we think about connection, 
We think about everything that involves in our community. We think about schools, we think about streets, we think about transit, we think about health, we think about sanitation and access to opportunity. So in addition to those two, handicap, disability, and familial status as protected classes, 1988 actually also created additional enforcement mechanisms for HUD. It essentially what creates a job for me. Because we're able now to take administrative complaints and now we're able to investigate them and enforce against violators of the Fair Housing Act. Before, all we could do is attempt to conciliate. Now we have this law that allows some enforcement mechanisms, allows us to seek remedies for victims, allows us to take that broad inclusive law and have a broader net to address imbalance and discrimination. So on top of the individual disabilities of protected class, before I get into that, I wanna hit some talking points uh, for what I feel is success done by my agency currently. We're continuing to address discrimination complaints between ourselves and our fire housing assistance programs. Those are partners agencies with what we call substantially equivalent state and local fair housing laws. In Colorado, it's the Colorado Civil Rights Division. And nationally received approximately 10,000 complaints last year alleging some form of discrimination. Disability was the most common basis. We'll continue to investigate those acts of housing discrimination, identify victims, and we're also trying to increase our involvement with communities to be able to use enforcement or compliance through programs for civil rights requirements to broaden our ability to work to tackle issues of equity and assess the current housing market for its needs. We're continuing to proceed forward with linguist proficiency community access programs. We have now translated 100 vital HUD documents in 18 different languages. We also have a language phone line. If you are a housing provider, if you need to be able to communicate with somebody I can give you my card, you can call our office. We can facilitate language line services, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're beginning to embark on immigrant community outreach and aggressively fight to end discrimination that limits houses choices for immigrants and assist the integration of immigrants and newcomers into our larger society. To try to address the inequity that we see in the immigration, uh, with immigration issues and how that affects inequity and opportunities for all. Lending discrimination. Preventing lending discrimination is continuing to be our high priority. We have an enforcement action which resulted in a major settlement against a mortgage lender that discriminated on the basis of someone being on maternity leave. Create, compensate the victim, and we also create a victim's fund. Applicants can apply to HUD, and they can request for consideration of whether or not they have a meritable complaint, and then they can recover damages for that which they incurred. In addition to our, what we call our Fair Housing Assistance Program, our sister agencies such as the State of Colorado, we also have a Fair Housing Initiative Program for private nonprofit organizations, education and outreach. They also get enforcement grants to help serve as advocates for individuals. And just last month, HUD issued a rule for equal housing in HUD programs and prohibited discrimination on the basis of lesbian, gay, bi, and transgender. The rule that we published on March 5th is called the Equal Access to Housing and HUD Programs Rule. It includes a general provision in HUD assisted housing or insured by the Federal Housing Administration to be made available without regard to actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, and marital status. We clarify the definition of family and HUD programs to be more inclusive rather than exclusive or rather to avoid the interpretation of exclusiveness. And the rule prohibits actual or perceived sexual orientation and gender idea, identity from being grounds for decision in making decisions for FHA insured loans. So an even broader net to try to address discrimination based on lesbian, gay, and bi transgender. And another thing which is not necessarily considered a fair housing law as much as an equal opportunity law, there's a statute called Section 3 of the HUD Act of 1968. It's about economic opportunities. It was initially referred to housing investments resulting in employment higher. Section three directs recipients of certain HUD fundings to provide job, training, employment, and contractual opportunities to low-income individuals in connection with projects and activities in their neighborhoods and communities. In 2010, we saw those investments create 39,000 new jobs, 47 which went to low-income or public housing residents. We've launched pilot section three business registry to assist our communities, our low-income individuals who are seeking jobs, and for our federal recipients. Hopefully that'll find its way to our region. Obviously they hit the bigger, more urban areas before they come 
to Colorado, but hopefully we can take that as a model going forward to try to ensure that when we fund activities and jobs are created out of those, they're directed to those people who live in those areas who need those jobs. I mentioned earlier about the number of disability cases is the most prevalent uh, number of complaints that we receive each year. Many of these are reasonable accommodations and reasonable modification requests. I have two handouts in one. It's called the Joint Statement on Reasonable Accommodations and Reasonable Modifications. And the reason why I brought that is because I keep it with me on a daily basis. It provides good guidance on how to evaluate these requests. These requests are always going to be fact specific. Can you imagine with that level of disability related complaints, we obviously, most of them have the tenor or underlying facts of a request for a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification. And when we think about reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications, the basic analysis in my mind always is equality. What is equal? How do we address those? Once again, it's about balancing our living patterns. Oftentimes in these settings, we get asked the questions, well, how do, you, how do I handle this request for a reasonable accommodation? And I'm going to give you the total lawyer answer about what I do to handle requests for reasonable accommodations. I take out my Fair Housing Act. And with every request, I have to read the law to myself to determine whether or not this situation or fact pattern fits to what's being described. So what do you think about reasonable accommodations? Discrimination includes a refusal to make reasonable accommodations in rules, policies, practices, or services when such accommodations may be necessary to afford such person equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. Just based off of that brilliant, flowery statutory language is the concept that everything is going to be fact specific. We have to walk these through each one at a time. There is not a black and white answer. There is, there is not a yes and no answer simply based on the articulation of a request. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of things. To, every assistance animal request is not necessarily the same. It's probably never even close to the same. Different facts, different variables, changes the analysis, changes the evaluation, often changes, changes the tenor of the request. One of the biggest things that we see, and I'm sure most people in this audience probably guess, is that we get complaints about assistance animals the most. With the new passing of the American with Disabilities Act in 2008 and the definition of a service animal, we also get those questions, those limitations, request to limit just the assistance animal to the service animal. I'll just give you what <coughs> HUD defines an assistance animal to be. Animals that assist, support, or provide service to persons with disabilities, or animals that are necessary as a reasonable accommodation to assist, support, or provide service to persons with disabilities. I bring up that definition because you can see it's very broad in the sense that it'll include service animals, which under the ADA, that's where you get your typical service dog. You also have assistance animals, support animals, emotional support animals, companion animals, and therapy animals. Anytime you get these requests, anytime you are making these requests, it'll be a fact-specific scenario. You have to walk through the analysis. Is there a need for this accommodation? Is there a rule you need to be accommodated from? Is there equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling? So analysis is always case by case. But by case by case, I mean everyone that walks through our door, and by that anything that gets either asked as a technical assistant question, asked from a housing provider, asked from a HUD recipient, asked from a tenant, asked from a resident in a homeowners association. Is the individual a person with a disability? Does the housing provider, the condo association, the home ownership association, do they know that the person has a disability? Is there a reasonable accommodation that may be necessary to afford a tenant an equal opportunity to use and enjoy his or her dwelling or home? And would that accommodation not constitute an undue or fundamental alteration on that housing provider, on that condominium association, on that city, that's the simple four-step analysis. Every single case that we see, we have to do that every time. Have to fit the pieces, the elements, to ensure that we are actually applying the law to the proper facts. So I'd be more than happy after this to take questions on reasonable accommodations. You can probably guess I love taking fact-specific questions. They're 
pretty interesting and we get to a lot when we get dialogue on issues rather than just me spouting how I apply the law. But we celebrate Fair Housing Month because it highlights the steps that we took 44 years ago, the steps we took 24 years ago to move closer to that promise that was articulated at the time of the revolution. I mentioned President Lincoln and as he transformed, he saw fulfilling the promise of the American Revolution as a triumph of mankind's political and moral freedom. The changes that fair housing and fair housing laws make in individual lives and communities through the promise of the Fair Housing Act. This is a tribute to those who saw a path towards equality and a tool to achieve it. We should celebrate it, and this is evidenced by increasing the opportunities and access to opportunity across the country. So I ask all of us to come together to build inclusive and sustainable communities free from discrimination, to pursue that goal of live free, open housing, and join together to create equal opportunity in every community. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's always hard to file, follow James with uh, statistics and maps, but we're going to do that for a little bit, and then we'll talk um, about fair housing barriers that you all have encountered or that friends or family have encountered in Fort Collins. And I certainly want to leave some time to ask about the trickiness of reasonable accommodations law in particular, but any types of fair housing law. And since we have James here, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to do that. So I'm going to walk through some of the facts, some of the quantitative as well as qualitative analysis that we have performed for this analysis of impediments. I'm going to remind everybody what fair housing is briefly and talk about the study that we've done, which is called Analysis of Impediments to Fair Housing, Choice, or an AI. We'll talk a little bit about some definitions and something called concentration analysis, which is a required component of our study. Jen's going to talk about what we did to encourage public input and the findings from our survey research as well as interviews. And then we'll talk about, um, we'll have a discussion around fair housing barriers and, and let you all ask questions. Very important that we let you know who you can contact in Colorado if you have fair housing questions, if you feel like you need to file a complaint, or if you feel like you've been discriminated against. This is not just for individuals who want to file a complaint, but for anyone who has fair housing questions. All of these organizations have good information about fair housing as well as the latter two legal services on their website. Cross Disability Coalition and Legal Services <coughs> help specific populations with a wide range of legal needs. The HUD office here is James' office. Colorado Civil Rights Division is the organization within the state of Colorado that not only enforces state, but also has the authority to enforce the federal fair housing law. So this is probably the most important slide in our presentation. Gives you a lot of information to who to, of who to contact if you have any questions. James talked a bit about the Fair Housing Act and the origin of the two parts to the act. The piece that was passed in 1968 as part of the Civil Rights Act, as well as the amendment in 1988, which brought in people with disabilities and familial status as covered uh, classes. There are some exemptions from the Fair Housing Act. These exemptions are meant for people with seniors. So there is, as you all know, there are senior-only communities, and those are exempt from the Fair Housing Act. There's also some small other exemptions for small properties as well as housing that is uh, reserved for religious practices. Colorado fair housing law is similar to federal fair housing law. It offers a couple of additional protections. We protect based on marital status and sexual orientation and gender status became part of the law under Governor Ritter a few years ago. Again, I, I noted that this is enforced by the Colorado Civil Rights Division. In Colorado, because of what we, we have, a, what's called a substantial equivalence law to the Federal Fair Housing Act, we have a state agency that kind of take complaints and enforce the Fair Housing Act. That's not true of all states. Idaho, for example, state law doesn't cover familial status, and so the state of Idaho couldn't cover or couldn't investigate a case based on familial status that would need to go to HUD. In Colorado, our state agency has the authority to enforce both acts. Why, why have Jen and I come here and why are we doing this study? Uh, Fort Collins is a community that receives something called CDBG. It's Community Development Block Grant. It is, th these are HUD funds, block grant funds that come from HUD for to come to s directly to communities of a certain size so that they can invest in community development and housing activities. Now HUD wouldn't want to give these monies to communities who are discriminating or who are creating barriers to fair housing choice. So as part of of this recipient, as part of being a recipient of these funds, the city of Fort Collins has to conduct this study. 
The City of Port Collins also has to conduct a couple of other reports. One's called a consolidated plan. There's an annual action plan and something called a caper, which tells HUD and the public how the city spends those dollars. The analysis of impediments to fair housing choice has a number of different tasks to it, but uh, most broadly, it's a review of census data. We look at the concentration, um, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, of people in Fort Collins uh, by race, ethnicity, disability. We look at the private practices and public practices. So James gave the example of exclusionary zoning or land use zoning practices that would exclude certain people from, t from neighborhoods. We look at that as part of the study. For private practices, we look at mortgage lending activity to see if it appears there's a big disparity in who's receiving loans and loan denial rates. We do a big public process that Jen's going to talk about in just a moment. And the ultimate reason for us doing this is to examine whether or not protected classes are housed in concentrated areas in the community if they're receiving a disproportionate level of services or treatment that affects their ability to be housed on a bal in balanced, uh, balanced patterns. A, a couple of definitions that are key to understanding the concentration analysis. Uh, we, I'm going to show you a couple of maps that look at our, that, that demonstrate our concentration analysis. So where we have identified areas of concentration of race and ethnicity, those definitions, those maps use the definitions that are here. This comes out of um, this comes this comes directly from HUD. So it's not a definition that BBC uses. The way that HUD defines an area of concentration is when there is a particular class, so a particular racial group that has 20 percentage points more of a proportion in that particular census tract than in the market area overall or than in Fort Collins overall. I'll talk about that and give an example of that in just a moment when I show you the map. When we think about the AI, our main charge is to identify disproportionate impacts. So we want to know if there are barriers to housing choice that impact members of protected classes. The other way to think about this is that if there's an equal opportunity barrier, it's not a good thing, of course, if there's any barrier to housing choice, but affordability, lack of affordability, for example, if it doesn't impact one or more protected classes, it's what is called an equal opportunity barrier and therefore doesn't have a disproportionate impact on a certain protected class. So just because your community is not affordable doesn't mean that, that, that you're violating the Fair Housing Act. And I don't mean your community is Fort Collins, a community. So let's look at some of the areas of uh, our concentration analysis. The first one here is the proportion of people who are low income. This presents by census tract the percentage of households who are living in the census tract, their, whether or not they're low income. And the darkest shaded areas here indicate areas where, the, where more than 46% of households are low income. These would be areas that are identified as concentrated by the percentage, 20 percentage point definition. If we look at the percent of residents who are minority, these are predominantly non-white Hispanics. This is where they're living in, in Fort Collins. And again, the dark, darkest shaded areas, the areas of concentration. By the definition, these areas are 20 percentage points more than the overall percentage of minorities in Fort Collins. So that's 37%. You can see that this slide here, which just shows the percent of Hispanic residents, this aligns pretty closely with my prior slide, which showed all minorities. So the concentrations in Fort Collins, prim primarily in the northern part of the city, and these are largely concentrations of people of Hispanic descent. So when we think about racial and ethnic concentration in Fort Collins, it's occurring in a few census tracts, the northern part of the city, and it's predominantly Hispanic concentrations. We see this generally with all cities. This isn't a, a severely concentrated or severely separated city. It's, it's certainly not as dramatic as we so, see in most areas, but there are areas where there are pockets of concentration in Fort Collins. So, so Fort Collins is not concentration free. Persons with disabilities, we show far less concentrations. In fact, there are no census tracts that are concentrated by the 20 percentage point definition. So you see there are no concentrations or no census tracts that are shaded with the darkest color here. By our definition, we would conclude then there are some clustering of people with disabilities in Fort Collins, but no severe concentrations of people with disabilities. 
We also look at female-headed households. Recall that James talked about familial status being a protected class. We look specifically at female-headed households because in the surveys that we've done and the public input process that we've conducted, we've found that female heads of households tend to face, uh, be more vulnerable to housing discrimination than a married couple household with kids. And they also tend to have lowest, the lowest incomes. Female-headed households have the highest rates of poverty in most communities and nationwide. And so we know that they have more difficulty finding affordable housing than a two-earner household, for example. Just one census track here that shows a concentration of female-headed households. The other thing that we look at is the distribution of subsidized housing. So what we want to see is that, and this actually shows the distribution of Section 8 vouchers a HUD subsidized program that's administered by the Housing Authority. We look to see if there are real strong concentrations of assisted housing in a community, and then we'll take that next step and see if they're overlaid, if they are correlated with areas where there are a lot of low income people or racial and ethnic concentrations. This map here tells us that there's a lot of good news. In some communities, we'll see Section 8 voucher holders concentrated very significantly in just certain parts of a community. You can see that in Fort Collins, there are some areas where there are some um, kind of build up or some uh, clustering of the little triangles here which indicate voucher holders residences but mostly it's pretty the voucher holders are pretty well distributed throughout the city there are some areas where um, there aren't a whole lot of voucher holders that could be associated with the lack of multifamily housing so these are renter households who um, are receiving tenant-based rental assistance through the public housing authority and from HUD if there's not multifamily housing and not single family housing for rent, they generally don't have an opportunity to rent in that area. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jen, and she's going to talk about the public input process. So the city of Fort Collins uh, really went through a pretty substantial uh, public input process <laughs> with the development of the AI. Uh, for example, uh, through working through community members, 1,300 paper resident surveys in English and Spanish were distributed throughout the community. We received 400 responses, which is a sizable response, and we were quite pleased with that. The city also promoted uh, the survey online on its website uh, and through um, a variety of means. We also reached out to stakeholders and invited them to participate in a survey, and we had 44 responses to that. And then we conducted focus groups and in-depth interviews with stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, we're really talking about housing and human services providers who are working uh, within the city of Fort Collins. Uh, so the uh, other aspect of the public input process is tonight's fair housing workshop. So thank you all for coming. And before you leave, make sure you sign in because that's part of how we document uh, what we're doing. We also made every effort possible to uh, provide for accessibility modifications for persons with disabilities. For example, the online survey is, was hosted on a website that is Section 508 compliant and has been audited. Uh, and then uh, opportunities were made to make reasonable requests for accommodations for uh, any of the public meetings and so forth throughout the process. So it's just sort of a high level overview of what we did. And I'll give you a bit of information about the, the resident survey in particular. When we do these studies, we really try to do our best to reach members of the protected classes. So this survey is not representative of the people of Fort Collins. This is representative of uh, persons who tend to be low income uh, and who uh, we really did a tremendous amount of outreach uh, for. So uh, we think, based on our results, that we've done a pretty good job of obtaining the perspectives of members of protected classes to gain their input into this process. So among the residents, 34% have children under the age of 18. About one in 10 are Hispanic. One quarter were students. 60% of our respondents are renters. And 6% are homeless. Uh, the median non-student income of our survey respondents is 25,000 to 34,000. 25% of our respondents have a member of their household with a, with a disability. And of those households that include a member with a disability, almost one in three are living in a housing unit that does not currently meet their accessibility needs. So that's a key finding uh, from this study. We also ask questions in our survey to get a sense of the community climate. So we ask people to 
uh, state their level of agreement with the statement, I feel that people like me and my family are welcome in Fort Collins. And for three out of four respondents, they agree. People like them are welcome in this community. 15% are neutral, but one in 10 disagree. And we always ask as a follow-up question, if you disagree with that statement, why is it that you feel like you and your family are not welcome in this community? By and large, among the Fort Collins respondents, raised issues of class uh, and feeling like low-income people are less welcome in Fort Collins than uh, those of moderate and high incomes, that uh, they're not welcome because they're not white, that they're not welcome because they're a single parent, they're not welcome because they're transgender, they're not welcome because they're gay, or they're not welcome because they have a criminal history. So those are all of uh, just kind of a summary of the types of reasons why some people don't feel welcome in the community. We also ask our stakeholders and residents about potential barriers uh, to fair housing choice that they may have encountered in the community or that they see as a serious barrier to fair housing choice within Fort Collins. Among stakeholders, some of the key barriers they identified uh, were the low, uh, poor credit histories of minority borrowers, lack of affordable housing near transit options, the income levels of minority and female-headed households, difficulty selling their current home because of the economy and the change in the housing market, and also, finally, a lack of accessible handicapped housing. Uh, stakeholders rated almost 40 different potential barriers to fair housing choice. Uh, and these were some of the ones that really floated to the top from that stakeholder group. We asked similar but more limited questions of residents, and they really identified as what they saw the key barriers to fair housing choice for them are income, a lack of affordable housing to rent, concentrations of affordable housing in certain areas, and a lack of affordable housing to purchase. Um, these are very, very common responses that we see in almost every community in which we do this work, and uh, it's really not at all surprising. We also ask residents if they have ever experienced discrimination in trying to rent or purchase housing in Fort Collins. And of our respondents, 25% believe that they had experienced housing discrimination in Fort Collins. And of those 25%, more than half of them said that the discrimination had occurred within the past year. Many reasons are offered for why people think that they have experienced housing discrimination, and these are in many ways in line with what uh, James said he's been seeing uh, at the national level and regionally. Um, disability is a major issue, both uh, discrimination for, uh, with regard to physical disability and not being, able, uh, not being accommodated to issues associated with behavioral and mental health as well. Uh, refusals to accommodate service animals, uh, familial status, people who have kids and they're encountering uh, landlords that don't want to rent to them because they have children, uh, their race or ethnicity, that they are low income or have poor credit, and criminal history. And so in addition to those types, uh, these kind of stated reasons for discrimination, you know, we also get answers that are, aren't really a fair housing issue. Uh, you know, that I have large dogs, but they're not service animals, or um, I, I have poor credit, or I have a felony on my uh, background and so forth. So there are many reasons um, students, for example, often feel that they're discriminated against because they are students, and sadly, uh, that can happen, I believe, <laughs> because they're not a protected class. Uh, but anyway, so that's sort of the big picture on uh, experience with discrimination that we see here in Fort Collins. Uh, so some additional findings from the research. As Heidi mentioned, we look at home mortgage data and found that there is a lending disparity between mortgage denials of non-Hispanic and Hispanic borrowers of about 11 percentage points. Uh, the city's comprehensive plan does not appear to establish any policy-based impediments or barriers related to fair housing choice and the fees charged by the city for development activities do not appear to result in any barriers or impediments to fair housing choice. Finally, we also undertook a significant review of the city's land use code uh, and it's strong but we could see a few improvements. Um, and so some potential areas for improvement in the city's code include a, a clear purpose statement within the land use code that identifies the city's intent to provide fair housing opportunities 
to all residents and to comply with federal and state law regarding housing choice and availability, adding a definition of disability that is consistent with the Fair Housing Act definition of the term, uh, better alignment of purpose statements for the residential zone districts within the cities with the city's intent to provide fair housing opportunities, uh, clarification about the regulations for overnight shelters, uh, and expansion of the criteria for, grant make, for granting modification or variance approvals to include making reasonable um, accommodations to address handicap accessibility to ensure full participation of all community members. That's uh, really just the preliminary findings from the AI. Uh, but what I'd like to do is get us awake and uh, talking and I'd like to find out your preliminary thoughts about what you've heard tonight, whether it's for the study findings or the presentation from HUD. So I'm wondering when you were um, doing this, did you look at that three unrelated category in Fort Collins where you can't have, you know, whatever it is, two related plus one or three unrelated? And, and I think that's not really based on a size of a house because you could have a house with eight rooms and still you wouldn't be allowed to have somebody. <laughs> And I think that discriminates against the poor people as well as the students yeah. in our community. We explicitly asked about that in both the resident survey and in the stakeholder survey. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, among the um, overall zoning and land use barriers weren't seen as like, uh, we ha had them right on a scale from zero to nine where nine is a very serious barrier. And all of the zoning and land use barriers were rated five or lower. So it really wasn't seen as an intense, serious barrier by the majority of stakeholders, but um, they certainly did, uh, the U, U plus two uh, rule uh, certainly was the highest rated among that class of sort of modestly rated um, barriers. And stakeholders did really point out that, um, you know, I think while the intention behind some of those occupancy restrictions, especially in college communities, is to help stabilize your housing market, to help uh, neighborhoods stay neighborhoods and not be invaded by students or having too many people in one house, I, I get that. Um, but on the other side, as one of the stakeholders pointed out in the survey, it makes it very difficult for your lowest income residents to pool their resources and share a home. And, and it, it's the absolute fact, it's completely true. Clarion Associates, who is a Fort, Fort Collins land use pl and planning firm, they did the review of the land use and zoning barriers, and they looked specifically at the occupancy regulation and didn't feel like it created uh, barriers relative to what they typically see in a community. So occupancy restrictions are allowed. And I know some of you have comments for James um, specific to re reasonable accommodations. So please feel free. I know this is kind of a hot button, but have, has HUD um, revised their stance on medical marijuana in public housing? Or what is their stance? <laughs> we never revised, we haven't really revised this stance. There is an internal memorandum that we have um, that I think has made its way in the public sphere by now. But the medical marijuana analysis on the federal, federal level is marijuana is classified as an illegal controlled substance, a Schedule One illegal controlled substance. The way that classification works is that it doesn't fall itself, it's an illegal drug. If you are public housing authority and you do the analysis under non-discrimination and disability um, in your programs and activities, which is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, um, I believe the bar is the individual can't be an individual with a disability because they're a current user of illegal drugs. And not only that, the regulations prohibit entry to someone who's a current user of illegal drugs. Under the Fair Housing Act, You'd walk in the private context, you'd walk through the analysis a little bit, but if you're a housing provider and you deny the accommodation, well, would it be an undue fundamental alteration to their housing program to allow someone who is a current user of a legal controlled substance under federal law? That sounds like it would be a fundamental alteration of the person's housing program. That would be a, a valid defense to assert. So the analysis really ends and begins with medical marijuana and that it's still an illegal controlled substance under federal law. And that's going to cut off the individual who makes that request, either on the analysis of determining whether or not you're an individual with a disability, and on then on top of that, whether or not they can validly be a current user of illegal drugs and be in um, subsidized, federally funded housing. And so we're trying to do what's fair. 
And so we're, you know, I, I was mentioning before to James that we had a case where somebody had their kitten and it was going to be a therapy kitten. And so how do you know when somebody just wants to bring their kitten over and when it's really a therapy cat? And so is there a place where we can go to on the web? And we just look up and try and research best we can and do the best answers we can. It's walking through the steps. It's, yes, there is no easy answer. Everyone's yeah. different. But there's no information on the web that's going to allow you to make that, grant that request or deny that request. You have to look at that individual making that request. What is their need? What do they provide you so that you can connect the dots between uh, the request and their disability, that you create that nexus? And the purpose of granting the reasonable accommodation is to give them an equal opportunity in use and enjoy housing. So it's not giving, bestowing on an individual with a disability greater rights. The point of the therapy cat there is there is something that individual has a physical or mental impairment which now has limited one of their major life activities and that cat is going to allow to ameliorate the effects of that impairment so that they have that equal opportunity to use and enjoy a home. It's different sometimes I think with these requests get challenging because they, they come up in so many different manners. A kitten here might be an exotic animal over here, and then that's a whole other ball of wax. We're not going to go into exotic animals hopefully today. <laughs> you just have to walk through the steps, and if you're a housing provider, unfortunately, it's the business we're in. I mean, especially if any people in here do subsidized housing or federally funded housing, what's the one phone number that every individual has access to? That's the HUD for housing complaint line, and we encourage them to call, or at least I do. But so they are always going to be asserting their rights and you just have to walk the steps you have to take make sure you have the necessary documentation obviously if someone asks for a modification to their doorway and they're in a wheelchair you probably shouldn't be calling up their doctor and asking them for a diagnosis technically you shouldn't be asking for a diagnosis ever James can I ask you a question that I get a lot when we do these forums which can I as a landlord get information from the from a physician in with, without going through my tenant? Can I request that the tenant waive that so that I can go right to the physician to get the information? You could do, medical release forms are somewhat common. Um, if you're in public housing, you probably uh, have dealt with those before. You make sure you have to get, you have to be able to, if there's gonna come circumstances where you're going to need more information to know that this accommodation was, for lack of a better way to say, prescribed. And there's going to be certain instances where you just don't have the knowledge by just taking it from maybe the tenant's mother. But you have to make sure you're careful. And I think the joint statement of reasonable accommodation speaks to who is going to be qualified to be able to provide that information. And you have to go in that analysis and think to yourself, who's providing this information? How do they know the individual? What have they described to me? Have they presented me with an idea that there is this disability, there is this impairment, there is this need? You know, I talk, I, I sort of showing off, we pull out this Fair Housing Act, because I do carry that everywhere I go, ridiculous as it seems, and I do look at that, and a lot of times with these requests, you kind of have to think, what do I know? Okay, what is the definition of an individual with a disability? Do they meet that definition? Because sometimes it's not easy, and sometimes, yes, you do need to go through the steps as a housing provider to be able to ask for a medical release, to be able to, ask, you're not looking for a specific diagnosis, you're trying to verify that that individual actually has that impairment that now they have the need for an accommodation to ameliorate the effects of that disability. Does that answer your question? It's a very backward way of saying depends. depends. We'll go ahead and conclude the formal part of this presentation. Thank you very much for coming tonight.